On this week in sales, we're going to be taking a look at Outreach, who are proclaiming that email rates, uh, email open rates and reply rates no longer matter. We're going to take a look at how only 25% of sales organizations have defined their own sales metrics. And we're going to answer the question, the burning question that I know the entirety of our audience want to know, does Will's beard make him a better salesperson than Victor. All that and much, much more. My name is Will Barron. I'm one half of This Week in Sales, Victor Antonio, the genuine legend of the, the sales training industry and sales speaking industry. Victor joins me. How are you, sir? How's it going? I am doing super well. All good on this side. How about yourself? I'm good. Me and Victor just had a little bit of a chat off camera about something exciting for myself and my little family, and it will inadvertently affect these shows and all this content as well. So maybe we'll talk about that after Christmas in a few weeks' time. But yeah, I'm excited and I'm pumped to, to dive into this with you today. And by the way, Will, I have a Greek tragedy that I want to share with the audience okay. at the end. At it the is end. a tragedy of technological proportion. It's a technology Greek tragedy that I will only share at the end. And I'm telling you, you want to stay tuned for this one because <laughs> it, it is going to show you. Well, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm just saying it is a true technological Greek tragedy that I want to share. How's okay. that for a teaser for the end? That is a teaser. You will also have to explain to me being uh, slightly dim what a Greek tragedy actually is, but we can come to that later on. Victor, what have we got up first, mate? <laughs> Zendesk becomes the first customer experience platform to join Unity Verified Solutions Partner. I put this one in here just for you, Will. Okay. Just for you. Uh, so anyway, program partnership enables uh, the partnership enables integrated customer support within today's most popular games. Because I think Will Barron likes video games. So Zendesk is building on his customer experience leadership by becoming a Unity Verified Solutions Partner. Being a verified solutions partner means Zendesk has been verified by Unity to ensure that its SDK, which I think is a software development kit, is optimized for the latest version of Unity. Now, Unity is a gaming platform, and I never thought about this, Will, that by using Zendesk as part of the support structure within Unity, like I said, in other words, gaming folks have problems, this is how it all fits in. I'll read the rest. The partnership with Unity, the world's leading platform for creating and and operating real-time 3D content will provide integrated customer support functionality that can be set up in minutes directly with some of today's most popular games, such as Angry Birds 2 and Pokemon Go. What are your thoughts on that? So is this saying that you ha you're you playing a game and you've got a problem, usually you would quit the game or the game's just exploded, so that's why you've got the problem. And so you then go to some kind of external support forum and you have to call someone or email someone. Is this saying that that now is integrated within the game? And so maybe not right now, but it could be you walk up to a certain character that's an avatar and that's really a customer service person in game and they can help you in real time. Is that is that what it's describing here? I don't think, it, I, I didn't get that far as far as it being an avatar. What I got from it is that when you jump out of the game, I assume you jumped out of the game the customer support information is now going to be stored somewhere in this relational database called Zendesk, right? And from there, they're going to be able to use that data to make the game better or maybe solve some Got problems. It. So it's kind of a feedback loop to solve problems. I don't think you could walk up to a magical Zendesk desk, you know, in the game says, uh, got a problem right here. Uh, Why not? This is not working. So. <laughs> Why? Because you, you, are you listening? You, in? you might go from, uh, <laughs> you might leave the game to go and speak to a chatbot. There's no reason why you couldn't have that chatbot in game, right? You're absolutely right. That would be kind of a cool thing, yeah. right? Within there, there's a little help center somewhere. A little, wouldn't it be a help center? It would be some kind of cool help monster, robot, <laughs> you know, genie that you, you rub a bottle as you pass by something. Says, I got a problem. I don't know. Yeah, by the cool. way, if you were to design the game, if you were to design the game, yep. what would that be? What would the help desk be to Will Barrett? So, by the way, this is almost like a Carl Jung get inside his mindset. Whatever he says right now gives you some insight into Will Barron's psyche. Here well, it comes. I'm going to be careful with my words so there's no Freudian slips here that will get me in trouble uh, further down the line. <laughs> so it clearly depends on the game, right? You're not going to have a Disney title and then have uh, a mask, a murderer that you've got to tackle and then beat up and then ask questions to. Um, <laughs> maybe it might work the other way around within a, a weird, crazy Grand Theft Auto game. You've got to strangle uh, Donald Duck to get questions out of him, answers out of him. 
But where all this gets really interesting, right, is within the world of uh, <laughs> within the world of virtual reality. See what I mean? This is what I mean. People listening, he just said strangle Donald Duck. I mean, where does that come from, Will? Where does that come from? Continue, please. It's, it's a deep, dark place where the audience and yourself probably don't want to know. I'm saying it with a smile, but I'm crying inside as I say it, Victor. Um, but all this comes to fruition really, and maybe I'm projecting 20 years, maybe not even 20, five years ahead, when we talk about VR, because when you're in a VR environment, whether you're going to a virtual conference, this would be perfect for that side of things of you don't know where your virtual seat is. You press a button and some, I don't know, customer service person pops up or avatar pops up next to you and you get to chat to them. Well, VR is, um, I've only got minimal, minimal experience of VR, but I've been told it's extremely jarring when you're in VR and a menu pops up because you get so wrapped up in the game or the the environment that you're in that it totally takes you out of it and it takes you five or ten minutes for your brain to get back into it. Uh, another example would be if you've been to the cinema to watch a film in 3D. At first, it's a bit awkward and you're kind of irritated. You don't quite, and your brain's trying to figure it all out. But after five minutes, if you can focus and or do the opposite focus, if you can relax and make your brain just accept the 3D that you're seeing, then it becomes a lot more immersive. So it could be useful for things like that. The reason all this came about, Victor, was I don't know if you're familiar with Pokemon Go, um, but it is, I always mess this up, is it augmented or augmented reality? Either. Maybe, maybe it's a British. Aug uh, augmented. Uh, or, yeah, so I'd augmented. say augmented. Uh, Pokemon Go is an augmented reality game. So you hold up your phone, you look through the camera, and you see a Pokemon on the desk in front of you. And you, I, I assume you try and catch it. I don't know. Um, so that kind of thing, where if you could hold up your phone, because not everyone has 3D glasses, and you know they're expensive. The, I mean, the the cheapest set that would be recommended would be you know like 500 quid a grand. But if everyone has an iPhone or a smartphone. If you could hold up your phone and you could see a customer service person stood there in the same room as you. You know, parts of the Zendesk platform. Platform. I like that. Then you 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 can almost have a slightly more. Uh, there's a layer of human interaction that you can have with an individual. And if you don't want to speak to them, same thing. You just put your phone down, and then you're done. So you've, you're yeah. the, the buyer still I, in control I, of all this. Yeah, I love what you said about. It. I never thought about it that way. That the, you know, the whole thing about the menu popping up it takes you out of the game. Uh, there was a study. You remember? You probably know the numbers better than I do. That if you're interrupted while you're doing some work. It takes you about 22 minutes to get back mm -hmm. to where you were at. So it's almost the same principle. So that, that's really interesting. Zendesk, Unity, please listen to my friend, Will Barron. He seems to understand gaming better than anybody else here and uh, where it's going. I wouldn't say that. I'm going to get some engineers calling me up for advice. <laughs> but no, yeah, I, I can talk about things that may or may not happen in the future. Some of it may or may uh, not be correct, but uh, anything beyond that is beyond my skills. So next up, Victor, we have some news from Outreach. And I'm intrigued to get your thoughts on this. So customers... This is quoting Outreach here. Customers buy on emotion and justify their decisions with logic. According to a Harvard study, 95% of purchasing decisions are subconscious. So why are we relying on vanity metrics like click, open, and reply rates to, to assess whether a campaign is doing well or not? So long story short, Outreach has come up with some other metrics. Now, there's perhaps some issues here of You've got to trust that the metrics work. I think it's pretty much a black box system of uh, we know this, this, and this leads to a successful a cold email campaign. So trust us on on the data. Uh, but it's interesting here of there's seemingly this push to move away from open rates, click rates that seem like a good metric on the surface. But if somebody is opening your message and clicking unsubscribe, clearly that should be taken as a negative versus if someone is just busy and they open your email and they don't reply or they seemingly don't open it and they open the fifth one and then they open the 20th and then they get on a call, clearly they call the email campaign and cadence is more complicated than what seems on the surface. So Victor, how does just, uh, we get more into it if you like, but how does that just uh, tickle you? Is this something that is you feel like has been missing in this industry of cold re outreach? The... I like metrics. And by the way, I understand what people mean by vanity metrics. Some metrics don't really contribute to anything. But I, but I think when I think about AI and machine learning, I always look at a constellation. That's my word, a constellation of data points. So I don't want to kick out the vanity metrics because they may be useful when you take it into consideration with other things. So I like the fact that we can keep metrics. Yeah, I get the vanity metrics. I would just say, let's not focus on the vanity metrics. Let's look at them as part of a Again, constellation may be a little dimmer, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and maybe the, the emotional sentiment piece 
those should be highlighted more because, again, how do we measure that, though? When you talk about sentiment analysis, it's usually about how something is said, the enthusiasm beyond the words or the phrasing and things of that nature. So I think it's, you know, I'll keep it all in the same bag. I, I want all the data I can, including vanity metrics. For sure. And clearly, you can see what Outreach is doing this here, maybe less from the engineering side, but on the marketing side, they want to separate themselves from every other platform who is just giving mm -hmm. you the, the bog standard open rates, click through rates, unsubscribe rates. And mm -hmm. hopefully it's tied into a CRM where they can see win rates at the end of it. So maybe there's a bit of a slight bit of spin on it here. But again, I'll, I'll quote from... Um, if you want to check it out over at outreach.io outreach forward slash explore, which we'll include in the show notes as well. Quoting again, to solve this challenge, Outreach is excited to introduce Outreach Insights featuring buyer sentiment analysis, first of its kind, yada, yada. So they're looking at buy emotions and signals to accurately represent sales engagement. Now, that to me mm. is, is massively open-ended of, Victor, let me ask you, if you were going to engineer this project, how would you measure sales engagement well it's interesting because i think outreach is overreaching if i can be use those <laughs> phrases their outreach is overreach over in the sense that when they're saying it's a first of a kind machine learning technology that classifies buyer emotions and signals to accurately measure sales engagement so let's kind of splice this because i because i read the article right i read what they put out and i said okay they're not the first in sentiment analysis everybody's been out there. you know that's already been out there what I noticed in their release was that I thought was interesting is that they're gauging engagement. But the key phrase here is, and, I, and I'll pull up the articles. It was, it was really interesting when you parse what they said. It was, by the way, this is a positive. The part of the report that I like was the sequence performance report, which said, measure and, analyze, and analyze true engagement with buyer sentiment analysis, nothing new there, to optimize. Here was a phrase that caught my attention, to optimize sequence and content performance. In other words, they're gonna be able to gauge, again, the facial recognition is already here. So the, to be able to actually read the facial expressions, tone, voice, audio, words used, and then say, you know what, when we say this first, it doesn't seem to resonate, but when we say this first and we move that here, then that seems to be a more powerful play or more powerful conversation. I think that's what they're really trying to say. And is it possible? Absolutely. And and you alluded to something else there, which uh, we should be clear on. This is over a campaign as well. So if you're only looking at open rates and click-through rates, it could be that they would perform better if they were flipped in the sequence. If one didn't exist, it might make the another one further down the line improve. And so there's we're getting to the point now where there's so many variables that it's very difficult to just send emails at an individual salesperson at some scale, you know, we can debate cold emailing versus uh, warmer emailing or how customized an email should be versus how many we should send. We can debate all that another time. Um, but we get to the point where if you are using a sequence of emails, you can't manage mm -hmm. this yourself, can you? It, it's got to be machine learning yeah. that kind of does the, the heavy lifting with what works and what doesn't. I mean, think about it. If, if the customers are going on their own journey and it's 80, 90 percent of the time they're going to get their own content, how many touch points are there? with your website, and then your responses, which responses should you send first versus which ones you should send second? You're right. It becomes so complicated, Will. A machine has to do this. It really has to. So, uh, you know, kudos to Outreach, man. They're, they're moving in the right direction. Good yeah. for that. Because if you tie this, I, I never even pondered on this before, but if you tie that into a platform like Drift, so you might get uh, an email which drives someone to the site, then the individual perhaps jumps in a, an automated chat, and maybe they don't book a meeting with the salesperson, which is fine, and they view a few other pages. Then you could have so many decision trees and, and, and algorithms working behind the scenes to see, well, this person isn't worth chasing up over email yet let them just stew a little bit longer let them go a little bit further on the buying journey and what i'm getting at is we've never had this data before because there's never been so many platforms interconnected uh, to to enable this to happen i mean that's what's happening right I, we're living in exciting times you know what i mean i personally think it's exciting from an engineering standpoint because what you just said is important right we got an email we received something from the website contact form. That's going to give us a lot of data. What they looked at, how long did their mouse hover over a certain picture, yep. how long did they take to read an article, all that stuff. And then they decided to send you an email or maybe they would decide to go into the chat bot. Whatever they decide to do, all these things, all these, as you say, decision trees, great phrase, right? Begin to kind of make sense for the, for the machine, but not for us, so. 
And, Exciting and, times, man. I'm excited. And this isn't in the doc, Victor. Uh, so you, you may may not be familiar with this, and it will come up um, probably after Christmas. It'll be we'll probably do a whole show based around this one topic because this might scupper everything that we're talking about now. Are you familiar with this new update that's coming to iOS and, and Apple devices that's going to allow people to opt out of uh, essentially being tracked online? I did not know this, no. Okay, so uh, just for anyone who isn't familiar, it was supposed to be an update that was supposed to come in uh, in December and they've now pushed it back to, as you said, Q1 uh, 2021 because there's been so much outreach, uh, outroar from the likes of Facebook. Now, it's top of mind for me today because I believe Facebook have just run a bunch of full-page adverts in uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and all these uh, big prestigious newspapers um, basically criticizing the fact that small businesses are going to lose access to a lot of their customers and the online uh, ability to track people and and target people with adverts on the back of what Apple are doing, which are uh, trying to position themselves as the security and privacy focused uh, brand. So what they're going to do is every time a in fact, I don't think it's a blanket opt in or opt out on the on the new iOS update is uh, uh, iOS 14 point something over that again is coming into Q1. But they're going to allow you to, when you install Facebook, for example, the app, they're going to allow you to opt out of Facebook doing any tracking of you via websites, via other apps on the platform, on the App Store, or via the Facebook app itself. Because right now, for people who aren't familiar, I know, Victor, you, you'll be familiar with this, we have things called pixels. So, for example, if you go on salesman.org, there is a Facebook pixel on there. And so everyone who goes through facebook.org and and downloads a podcast, watches the video, we use then Facebook to track those individuals. It sounds creepy as I say it out loud, but everyone's doing it. And this this might be the point here. I just tried to justify it by saying (laughs) everybody does it, um, but everyone does. And it allows us then to... I'm stalking you. I'm stalking well, that's you, what it is. It is okay. weird. It it's is okay. weird. So I won't. We won't go into too much detail because it will be a big topic when this rolls out. It'll be. It'll be in all the news. It'll be everywhere. But Victor, are you on, on a kind of? I know we've only scratched the surface here. But are you for more privacy? In which case, you lose the ability as a business owner to advertise and, and track your potential customers, which would scupper things like a drift, outreach, and things like that. Or are you for? We're in the wild, wild west. Everything seems fine. Everyone's tracking everything. Let's just let's just keep going the way we're going. See, I'm in the later group with the latter. You know what I mean? In that sense, I the thing is, we're always like paranoid, right? Oh, they're tracking us. They're knowing everything we're doing. They already do that. Even if you even if it's anonymized data, there's a way to figure out who you are. Let's be honest about this. So let's get that out of the way. Personally, I like to look at the glass half full when it comes to being tracked. There's been many times where the algorithm has suggested something that was partially in my brain, but based on whatever data points they use, I go, huh, never thought of that. What a great idea. Let me go buy that. You know what I mean? There have been moments like that where I'm like, thank you, algorithm. So, Are you sure, you think- though, Victor? Are you sure it didn't incept your brain and then planted the seed and you're buying it because of it? And it's a genuine question because that that is obviously possible no, it, as well. By the way, well, okay. Well, if we take that line of argument, which is a very good one, then we should uh, then we should question all advertisement. The billboard could have influenced me. Anything could have influenced me. But the right? billboard we'll doesn't know. know who you are, your your family status. Um, have you got pets at the home? Have you just had a child? There's, you know, a, a billboard is what it is. TV advertising. Oh, it might be so local. Here's where I'm going to push back. I'm sure. going to push back on this one because uh, we should do we should do what on this one. We're, we're now finding intelligent billboards. That's a big thing right now. So intelligent billboards, which have cameras, which we, have you seen the ones that can actually identify the type of traffic? They'll get a cluster of people, track the traffic within that cluster, and the advertisement on the board will change according to that cluster's demographics. Isn't that, I mean, that's where we're going, Well, We're we're into this Orwellian, I'm not going to say dystopian, but I'm not going to say utopian. Mm-hmm. What's between dystopian and utopian, by the way? Normal. Life. No. <laughs> By the way, if you're listening to this, please help us out. What's between <laughs> utopian, ideal, dystopian, not so ideal? But 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 I think all this is happening. I don't mind it. I'm just saying my personal feeling. What do you think the the if you had to do a uh uh I guess query the public, what percentage would be okay with being tracked and what percentage would not be? And by the way, if you're listening to this week in sales, go to thisweekinsales.com, uh give us some feedback, but that'd be great to hear your opinion. What do you think the percentage would be of track me, don't track me? 
So I think it would probably be 50-50. And I think it would be 50%, uh, you know, either way. So 25 of each of those groups would be educated and 50% of people would have no idea of the amount of tracking and weirdness that is going on. Some of it is weird. Now, a, a billboard that sees a Range Rover coming, so it advertises a Rolex, fine, whatever. But some of the data that I could pull from our audience who visit salesman.org, um, it, it's bizarre. You know, I don't need to know your polit political affiliations. I don't need to know whether you are, again, whether, whether there's a high chance of you being pregnant or being in a household that, uh, you know, that's more relevant if you're selling nappies or diapers or whatever. So there is, you know, business, uh, there, there is reasons why a business would want to know some of these things. But I am, if you're leading uh, one way towards, it's the wild, wild west, it's happening, there's not much we can do about it, and it's not particularly hurt, 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 hurting anyone. I'm slightly the other way of people don't realize that they are the product, for example, on Facebook. People don't sign up to Facebook, sign away all these rights, and Facebook have eroded your, you know, people don't read the terms and conditions. Clearly, I've never read a terms and conditions about anything in my life. And I click it all and I agree to things. But people, your your privacy rights have been eroded over the years. And I think potentially, eventually, it's a dangerous path to run down. Um, I, I guess that a, a, a one clear-cut example would be, are you okay with a private company having all this data about you? Mass, like, an insane amount of data. Would you be the same? Would you be just as happy like your government having the same amount of data about you as well? Mm -hmm. I think they do. By the way, you said something interesting. I heard this phrase somewhere, Will. It says, if you're not paying for it, you're the product. And I always thought this was a great phrase, and that's Facebook, right? If you're not paying for it, you're the product. And so I guess this is my cynical view coming out, and then we could just move on. But my cynical view, cynical view says, look, we can talk all we want about anonymized data, but I'm just telling you, there's so many different buying points. Unless you plan to go off the grid, not ever use a credit card, not ever use any type of electronic form of payment, there's no way to go off the grid, you know, unless you want to live in the mountains somewhere. Do they have mountains in England or in the UK, yeah. rather? Of course we do. Okay. <laughs> is your geography that bad? You don't. You think England's flat? <laughs> well, I, I know Scotland has hills, you know, but I, you know, I didn't think about it. You know, I, okay, good. It was good to know this, man. Good to know this. <laughs> well, with that, with, dumb that, with that bombshell, Victor, tell us about what fix. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got to compose myself. For this one. That was a bad one. That was a bad one. My. I, I, I formally apologize to everybody in the UK uh, for that question. So anyway, what fix is recognizing Gartner's latest report on, listen to this phrase. Have you ever heard this phrase? Digital adoption solutions. No, nope, I've never new heard for me. that phrase. And so what fix the leader in digital adoption solutions, AKA DAS, DAS, today announced has been included as a sample digital adoption solutions vendor in Gartner's report titled, you know, improve employee usage, engagement, productivity with DAS. Now, I saw this and I go, digital adoption, so what is that? Let me just give you the simplest form. What's happening today is that we have so many pieces of technology in our tech stack. And because we have, like, think of anything you use to sell, right? And onboarding and using these programs becomes that much more complicated. You want to spend more time trying to learn the program and you get frustrated, maybe don't even use it correctly. What this does, well, it is like a program that goes over the program. And what it does it creates these, in the simplest form, bubbles for you to say, start here. And it pops up these bubbles. In other words, it understands the program, almost like an overlay. And then it uses bubbles to actually guide you through the actual software. It's a very generic application. And I think it's fascinating. In a world where we have, let's say, five to 10 you know, apps in our tech stack, something like this will help you learn faster, adopt it easier. So I signed up for a, I can't remember what it was now, a similar product to onboard people onto the Selden.org uh, training program. It was a similar kind of thing. It blanks out the screen, highlights uh, courses and tells you a little bit about it and it forces you to click that and then it'll highlight the assessment that we do and, and force you to click that. But it was like a grand a month. So we, well, we just built a crap version of it ourselves for like well, probably 500 quid. It probably cost a grand. It probably cost more than that by the time you, you add up all the development and all the messing around and my time to to build it. But it was so expensive. But I get the, the principle here. And I guess to tie this into uh, salespeople, this is something that we should be, should, so let me tie this to salespeople this way. Should salespeople 
be feeding back to product teams when they get uh, responses from their customers of, we tried it and we couldn't understand it, or we we signed up and we didn't get past the, the first few phases of, of implementation because it was just too complicated. Is this something that salespeople should be feeding back to their own product teams, or should salespeople just be focused on getting deals done? Getting deals done. I, I think the whole feedback loop, it becomes more difficult, you know? And so I would say, I mean, what do you think? What's your opinion on this? So, you know, in a in a perfect world, in a utopian world, in a utopian business, mm -hmm. salespeople would probably meet with engineering or meet with marketing mm -hmm. and, and have these conversations because salespeople are at the front of the line, right? And uh, rightly or wrongly, some cultures within sales organizations are that salespeople are just there to get deals done. And that probably maybe drives more revenue, but a better product over the course of five years is probably going to drive more revenue than salespeople missing an afternoon on, on a Friday to, to discuss product development. So, you know, I'm, I'm conflicted. Probably we should, salespeople are the, uh, especially before the purchase, right? Then it maybe go to, goes to customer success or customer service. But up until that moment of sign up, salespeople are probably the best resource for engineers uh, to get that onboarding process nailed. But of course, I'm there to make money, right? I'm, I'm not there to support the company more than what I need to. And I agree with you. And having been on both sides as a salesperson, as a product manager for a software company, for a software development team, right? I was on both sides. And salespeople would always come back, hey, if we had this, if you could do this, if it only had that, man, I could sell more. If it only had this, it only had that. And then they never sign up for any type of quota, <laughs> right? They just say, it'd be nice to have. Or they'll use it as an excuse why they didn't win the deal when the annual review comes on you know, performance. On the product management side, they get so many suggestions that we used to keep a list and that list could be 100, 200, 300 items. And then we have to decide every three to six months what was actually going to go in. And the way we decided was we talked to the most credible salespeople who were killing their number. Sure. And whatever their feedback was, that's more likely what we would highlight or put into the next revision. But that still was a three to six month cycle before we got that in. Yeah, I guess what so I'm one. going at is more, rather than product features, acutely problems. Because... Mm -hmm. a, set, a, a new brand new customer if they've just been sold by a salesperson who they they you know, again the ideal salesperson they trust them they want to spend more time with them they want to leverage their expertise that's probably who they're, they're going to speak to that salesperson and say hey jerry you you told me it would do this this and this and i can't get it to do one two three they're probably going to tell jerry before they'll tell uh, murray in customer service right because it's a brand new relationship and and so that's probably where i was going at as opposed to new features of uh, hurdles within the onboarding process. Um, but yeah, I guess it is one of those, it should happen, probably doesn't happen enough, and what, what are we going to do about There's it, Victor? Be, yeah, there, there, there should be a way, though. You're bringing up a great point. There should be a way to find a way to funnel that back in a very effective way that doesn't take away from the sales process, but yet qualifies the opportunity at the same time. Yeah. Well, there's probably a product right there. If you can tie that into the likes of uh, what fix where people can give feedback via a salesperson. That, that might be the, the, the feedback yeah. mechanism. Okay, Victor, Absolutely. next up. Mm. This is what people want to know. People want to know that new research finds that if you grow a beard, you can grow your sales. So this is a genuine piece of published mm. research. The paper the way, reports... I think, I, think, I think we should pause. I think we should pause for a... Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. I feel like this should be like okay. a feature in the show. We should have some background music of like like jazz elevator music. I mean, you go, hmm. Yeah, and so then maybe I have like a pipe or something. I go, hmm. <laughs> 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 a paper Sorry. reports that on five studies that tested the quote unquote, the power of the beard in the workplace, they found that customers consider bearded salespeople to have greater expertise and therefore more trustworthiness than mustached clean shaven or stubbled co-workers this and this i thought this is interesting as well this is true regardless of race ethnicity attractiveness likability um both online and in-person sales so victor do you think there's some shenanigans going on here or do you think bearded individuals are more trustworthy than non-bearded individuals will i have questions at this point <laughs> any questions <laughs> the first one is does the length of the beard matter there's an interesting one. Hmm. Put that variable in. But, uh, I mean, joking aside, I mean, people with beards just seem more mature. And probably they tie that into more wisdom, 
more like, you know, that guy seems to do it. And then maybe that's something to stroke besides your chin. You can stroke your beard, you know, like, and really ponder. But I want to highlight something that was said here, but was not said to really get into this. <laughs> Will's going, here it I feel, comes. Going, I feel it comes. nervous. <laughs> yeah, you he said, they found that customers because they have bearded salespeople to have greater expertise and therefore more trustworthiness than mustache. You say mustache or moustache? A mustache. 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 Clean shaven or stubbled co-workers, which means that whatever that six o'clock shadow doesn't really work for you. What they didn't mention here was people who were follically challenged, who were bald. So, because I thought I should throw in my side of the story, I found an article on <laughs> Yahoo. Very interesting. And it says the following. This is by Katerina Benaris, released a year ago. It says the following. Bald men are more intelligent, successful, and masculine, says the science. If your male partner is worried about losing his hair, you can now let him know that his life is only going to get better. Bald men are often seen as much more successful and dominant than men with lush locks. So what does this mean? Well, I'm going to pull the two together. That if you're bald and you have a beard, you're, you're gravy. So you have to shave your head and I have to grow a beard if we're going to make this show work. That's my conclusion. What do you think? I think if you're bald and have a beard, you just got your head on upside down, right? <laughs> Say what? So the, the, I listen to the sales and podcast. We'll know this. I've talked about it before. Um, so my dad's bald. Um, my middle brother is bald. Unfortunately for him, because um, I think he was, he's fine now, but he, he was a bit bothered about it when he was a kid. He went bald at like 18, 19. <laughs> And um, it's my, just the way you say it. he's fine now. Well, he's fine now. yeah, because because he might listen to this. I don't want I don't want the audience to think that he's uh, you know emotionally scarred about. It. He just shaved his head in the end. Um, but he used to have long. But he's fine now. Yeah. Uh, but so th where I'm going with this, oh Victor, which you'll find interesting, may find interesting. You may not find it interesting as I'm as I'm passing what I'm just about to say. So he had a big, uh, strong, manly beard. Uh, now he works in uh, a pharmacy. And so with with COVID and precautions, he had to wear a mask. Now beards and masks don't compute because you've got a for ffp masks and, and and some of the audience depending on what industry you're working will be familiar with this you've got to have a tight seal otherwise there's no point in having or, or the mask there is a point in the mask but it's not as effective remind me to tell you my we analogy in a second for how masks work for anyone who's unsold on the idea of wearing a mask but in uh, clinical environments you need this i think it's an f and f ffp mask and it needs to be a seal around your face so that the what you're breathing in and out goes through a valve. And it's difficult to get via a, uh, with a beard. So what he was having to wear was <laughs> this big ridiculous helmet where they basically goes to a vacuum cleaner and he's walking around the hospital looking like, I don't know, something out of Ghostbusters or you know, uh, some kind of Mars spaceship film. So he shaved his beard. But now he's got this problem, Victor. You, your face doesn't quite do this. But my brother has, with no beard, no hair, a surprisingly round head. And it, it makes him look about 12 years old. I, I was in hysterics when I saw him a few weeks ago because I've not seen him since... He's had a beard for like so 10 so like, years. Yeah. So it's like a baby head on top yeah, of a man body? because he's bigger than me. He's a big fella. I was absolutely... I was What's laughing my head off. What's your brother's name? Uh, Phil. Phil? Deal with it, man. Yep. Deal with it, Phil. That's all I've said. Just deal with it. Baby head, we're going to call him. <laughs> Phil baby head. <laughs> I'm going to send him this. He's not going to be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna say let me go find that american yeah so, he's anyway, gonna track you down victor i love the fact that you highlighted this will and you know to let to let people know that that beard of yours is there for a reason it's there for you so i've got i've got a story i don't think we talked about in this week in sales i've talked about it on the podcast though the last company mm -hmm. i worked for the, the turmoil at a national sales meeting because i had probably this length of beard so not you know I'm, i don't look like gandalf for anyone who's listening to this rather than watching the show on youtube or linkedin or wherever it is you know it's it's probably like two or three weeks worth of beard and i have a, a beard trimmer that keeps it to this length right well the last job I, the last sales job i was in we went to a national sales meeting and i could hear people gossiping about the fact that i had a beard and there's all these rumors going around that you can't possibly have a beard it, you know it goes against all of our you know the corporate guidelines for men you've got to be in a suit you've got to have this you've got to have that so and me being the bit of a bit of an asshole that i am which is like well i'm going to even grow a longer one especially for the sales meeting just to see what happens and it, it ended victor with a showdown with a national sales manager who came over I was like, 
hey, is the beard a problem? He's like, no, of course it isn't a problem because how can we mitigate whether your facial hair? And then within a week, genuinely within a week, the whole team, a hundred odd salespeople all had beards. I was laughing my head off. It was hilarious. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny how, you know, we think about that as being ridiculous, but that was at a time you know, whether you should have facial hair or not. I mean, like even like tattoos, for example, right? Now it's like, who cares? You know, so I think times have changed. Yep. And, and Beard, look, intelligent. This is clearly, you know, a bit of a, a jokey uh, article that I wanted to include. But the reason I wanted to include it was, I feel like there are subconscious biases that we have of whether someone is well-dressed, whether someone is, you know, they've got a big bushy beard or they're, they're more maintained. And um, that there are probably social norms for, for women, rightly or wrongly, you know, how people are dressed, how they hold themselves, and you know, for, for men as well, uh, whether it's a, a suit or you're in a polo shirt and what's appropriate. And I just wanted to bring it up because some of these things are easy wins for salespeople. So if you're in sales and you're listening to this, you should dress probably how your customers are dressing. You should keep yourself smart. And the number of times I'd have just a smart, polished pair of shoes on, and you could see people looking at your shoes or people would just make a, a slight comment of, you know, oh, you've obviously cleaned your shoes today. I think, again, subconsciously, these things do have an effect. So make your life easy. This is this is an easy win for salespeople, isn't it? Just get the easy one. You remember that book by, uh, did you ever read the book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink? Yep, yep. Where Blink, where you make quick assessments. Mm-hmm. Especially what you just said. We make quick assessments of people very quickly, and maybe that adds to that. Hey, can we talk about Gartner for a second? We can. So Gartner says only 25% of sales organizations have a standard definition for sales metrics. I thought this was interesting. Gartner's State of the Sales of Sales Analytics 2020 outlines steps sales leaders can take to deliver analytics that help organizations overcome important challenges. Only 25% of organizations have standard-wide definition for sales metrics And in fact, the report reveals only 55% of sales teams standardize metrics across all business units, regions, and teams. I I found this. What do you think of that data point there, Will? What's your thought when you first read that? My thought is that underneath this, it might be more complicated uh, than what it seems. In that if 55% of sales teams standardize metrics across business units, it could be that a business unit is just so diverse. If you're selling in the same product, if you sell a camera into Japan and the UK market, it might be difficult to standardize your business units across both of them. But having said that, the numbers do seem low to me. And I don't know whether that is because it's you, you can feedback on this from more from a management perspective. Is it difficult to standardize numbers? Do you not want to standardize numbers because you don't want to be compared to your internal competitors within an organization because you want to either be able to spin the fact that you've done well or, or that they've done well? Uh, is it just laziness? Why, why do you think uh, these numbers are the way they are, Victor? I think a lot of people don't really think through the process of standardized metrics, but but you highlighted something again, really important, and that is that you may have different business units with different ways of measuring, but I'm wondering if there could be like, tiers of metrics. Maybe that's the way to look at this, that we can have standard tiers. We look at certain KPIs across all business. And then there's a second tier, which are more specific to a business unit. And maybe that's also what they're looking at. Like I said, the report doesn't really highlight that, but maybe that's what they're looking at is that because the businesses are different, it's hard to standardize across businesses, but you would think there would be some standards. Subconsciously, what I think might be going on is that the more metrics I define and standardize, the more my higher ups are going to hold me to that metric. And I don't know if I like that. Well, I don't know if I like that. Let me ask you, you Victor, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So, you know, we're both small business owners, salespeople, right? Do you Mm -hmm. have a holy grail metric? Do you have a standardized metric that every year you try and improve within your own business? Aside from revenue and cost, no. How's that for simple? That's pretty simple. Aside from revenue and cost, no. Yeah, I mean, well, the thing is, I look at, well, Here's some metrics I do monitor. I monitor traffic, right? So when I'm looking at websites, I'm looking at unique visitors versus return visitors, right? That's a big metric. Uh, when we our podcast, the Salesman Podcast, the Sales Influence Podcast, you know, again, what do we look at? Number of downloads, right? And then you also start to try to figure out, you know, what titles are hitting. And then even on my YouTube channel, like yours, we look at those metrics. So those are the standard metrics I use: views, number of views within a certain period of time. But if you ask me, Victor, have you standardized them? I go, no. How about you? 
Um, so I, I do everything you just said. If I was going to, if we're going to layer metrics, uh, as you as you outlined, um, clearly revenue and profit for a small business owner is really <laughs> the only thing that right. matters, right? Um, yeah, but one thing that, that, yes, it is, because we've got to stay afloat, right? Especially just going through the economic turmoil that we've just been. That revenue becomes, or profit becomes, even more important than in the good times because it's, you know, maybe it's been squashed, maybe it hasn't. Uh, but something I do focus on, and so, and I can I can perhaps ask your your feedback on how you would standardize this is um, uniqueness or the differentiation between myself and, and all the other people within uh, in the podcast world, podcast, and then the training world in the training side of things, which is where we have you know the illustrated characters and we do things a certain way and we collaborate with people like yourself uh, on on different projects. I try and uniqueness is top of the list for me revenue profit and then it's probably uniqueness underneath that but is that really a standardized metric because it's very difficult to to measure that in the marketplace yeah i i think it's hard for us to you know when, when we're really talking about product differentiation when we look at uniqueness right what is why are we different and we also know that within our business here is that anybody can copy what we're doing tomorrow so even if you came up with something different somebody's going to copy and have it right away but I think one of the I, I, it's an intangible metric you're talking about because it's part of why we like doing what we do, right? Because we can do it our way and we can pivot anytime. So maybe our ability to pivot quickly, whatever that speed is, is the metric we like. So if I can pivot, you know, within ten seconds, I like that metric. But if I work for an organization that takes me three months to pivot, I don't like that. So I think that's what we like subconsciously as entrepreneurs and small business owners. I don't know if I answered your question, but. I'm with you on the uniqueness piece. Yeah, it's, it's something I'm always focused on. It's something that uh, we, we bought new cameras for the studio. Uh, we, we're doing different things here. We're, we're moving to a new building shortly uh, to take all this up a notch. And so you're right. Someone could do a podcast, but could someone do This Week in Sales and it not be shit? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I don't think yeah. you know, our ego is kind of to one side for a second. Mm -hmm. Is a different question, and that nobody, leads us. Nobody can do it like us, Will. <laughs> nobody can do it like us. Exactly, like exactly, because it's unique. Because <laughs> it's it's personality based, which is you and I, which yeah. leads us into the next topic of influencers. And I, I genuinely want to get your thoughts on this. Um, I, I feel like this could be a whole. We could interview each other and, and do a podcast on this on the side because I think this is fascinating. So, title of the article and the articles from ZNet.com znet.com so zdnet.com i can't read my own typing the article is about influencers so the title is b2b companies will use decentralized tools to manage the role of influencers across across the enterprise which is a dry way of saying are influencers going to become more important than salespeople. Now, this is based on a report called into the mainstream influencer marketing society 2020 and it quotes that 73% of brands have upped their influencer marketing spend this year, despite, regardless of the pandemic. So there's some predictions here that this article and this report is talking about, which we'll touch on in a second. But Victor, how do, I feel like influencers are going to take the place of a lot of salespeople. I think like influencers at, are, are selling at mass. And a lot of what salespeople do, as we've talked about, is getting so crushed towards the end of the sales cycle they're just going to become customer service people. The influencers are going to, they're going to be the one disseminating information at the top of the sales cycle. They're building all that trusted distance up front. So is it fair to say, and challenge me if you don't agree, that influencers mm -hmm. are going to become as, if not more important than salespeople in, in B2B in, in the future? If I, I would agree with you, if you would allow me to put influencers under marketing, if you would allow me to put them under that umbrella of marketing, I am 100% with you because I think marketing is now, again, we've talked about this in the past. I used to laugh at marketing people years ago. I'm like, Haha, you don't even know what you do. You're even guessing, you know, that whole John Wanamaker, 50% of my advertisement works. I just don't know which 50%, right? And so I used to laugh at marketing people 20 years ago. Today, I can't laugh anymore. They're probably laughing at salespeople. Look, I'm handing it to you like a baby. Close it, you know, because it's that it's that as you're it's talking about that customer journey, them doing it on their own. So if you would allow me to put influencers under marketing, I would say that marketing is expanding its influence in the sales cycle. And as you say, squeezing out or squeezing down the sales, um, or the piece of it now. So you and I don't get in trouble, Will, and get a lot of angry B2B complex salespeople coming after us in certain sales. Obviously, you're going to need the salesperson to really be you know, the point of the spear to close the deal. Marketing will grab their interest, 
but you still got to go in there and close it on some deals. But when we look at commodity or we'll call it mid-market tools or appliances or products, marketing and influencers are dominating. No doubt. I, I will go further than that. And perhaps we're talking a few years into the future. I feel like these complex mm -hmm. salespeople, the few that remain, will be the quote unquote influencers. They may be employed by the organization. They may not be employed by the organization. They may have their own platform. They might have so much influence on their own. For example, they're, they're, I can't remember their website now to give them a, a plug, but there's a Salesforce CRM blog. And all the, do all the guy does is blog about Salesforce CRM, all different plugins. Obviously it's, it's, a, it's a massive uh, ecosystem. There's unlimited content that you can pull from it. But I bet you he sells just as many Salesforce licenses as teams within Salesforce because you've got that that pot potentially, if you're doing it right, I said it, I can't remember the blog. I'll, I'll try and Google it in a second. But you've got that extra trust with someone like that, that they are independent, that they are you know separate from marketing, that they can speak their mind, that they can say things that an internal quote unquote influencer might not be able to say. And I feel like a lot of sales jobs, and if you listen to this and you work in sales, I would I just cannot encourage you more to start thinking of yourself as an influencer. If you have no influence, you're doing it wrong. I, I guess that's the way I'd, I'd probably sum it up. But I think in the next few years, just to double down, I think a lot of complex B2B salespeople, perhaps they've been in the industry for 10, 20 years, they're going to be the ones that are, are, are going to be on the front of blogs, that are going to be shipped out to different places to do what more traditional influencers do right now. Oh, I love that. I love what you just said. I, I, I'm listening like, because I'm like, like I, I'm digging what you're saying, Well, because it's like the the influencer, this person who does the Salesforce CRM and just that's all he talks about, is positioning himself as a trusted authority in the market. And we all know that buyers are going on online and there's so much content and so much conflicting information that we're looking for authorities, experts, i.e. influencers. And so frame like that, I, that's a really good point. I would say if you're in the B2B complex sale, you want to become that expert in your business and you'll always be in demand. And this gets back to, by the way, what we talked about, I think last week, branding yourself like on LinkedIn as an authority by sharing great content. So I love what you just said. That's great. I never looked at it that way. Good stuff. And, and the website is sale that I was uh, quoting or not quoting was uh, that I was talking about was salesforceben.com. I've just gone on his about page. They get 250,000 readers a month, which in the grand scheme of media outlets is not that much. It's a, it's a lot, but it's not that much. But 250,000 people pondering on Salesforce is an incredibly niche and and, and valuable uh, resource. I think uh, readers, guest posters, 300 odd guest posters. I mean, he's got an email list of like nearly 8,000 people. That is an incredibly valuable valuable business if he's if he if he is hopefully somehow affiliated with Salesforce that he can he can funnel the right potential customers and to yeah. them and to make a commission from it. You you have you have my brain going now because you could do this for a lot of companies that run deep, right? Like let's just take Zoom, right? What if you become this? What's his name? His, his name is uh, Salesforce Ben. Ben. Yeah, so maybe uh, he'll become Zoom Ben tomorrow, right? Or Zoom Bernie is another guy, you know, that can just all talk about Zoom. You know, the latest and greatest things within Zoom, what you can do, what, as you say, what plugins, apps can I use? What can I do? I mean, and then people would go to that person. We just gave somebody a great idea, Will. I think we, by the way, if you take this idea, we want a commission off of you. <laughs> Right. Well, we'll saying. we'll promote you on the show. Get you your first couple of thousand views. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just I literally just googled Zoom uh, blog to see if if this was happening for Zoom uh, specifically. And of course, you've got to hitch your wagon to the right company. And if, you know, if you'd have done a Zoom blog just before the pandemic, it would have been maybe a bit of fluke. But you would have got so much traffic right now that and and B two B brands are buying. Outreach bought SalesHacker.com. Um, and, you know, it was a, an acquirement of, of different assets and people and other things as well. But B2B brands are buying smaller, ind somewhat independent uh, outlets. And you know, I've had acquisition conversations for salesman.org and, and nothing's ever kind of worked out from that perspective. But putting a bit of time aside, if you're a medical devices like I was, and just talking about, again, as independently as you can without pissing off everyone within your organization, if a competitor's product's better, clearly there's some... Uh, You've got to be you've got to be sensible with some of the things that you're going to say. But putting a little bit of time aside if you're medical device sales to build a little bit of an audience about the thing that you're selling that that it makes you almost unsackable. And once you get to a certain amount of content, a certain amount of attention, 
you're almost unsackable. You, you become what we're talking about, an influencer. Uh, un, un, by the way, that's a UK term, unsackable. Unsackable. <laughs> I don't think it's a UK don't term. I think I just made it up. <laughs> unsackable. Okay. I wanted to ask you, while we're on this topic, it's not in our show notes, but uh, I'm going to highlight two people or what, two entities here, one person, one entity. Ring DNA partnered with a gentleman by the name, I think it's Andy Paul, right? Yep. And so they're co-branding a podcast, Ring DNA, Andy Paul. Andy Paul, well-known in the sales world. Just, I, I you know, he interviewed me. I, I love his riff. I mean, he's just smart guy, a good choice by Ring DNA, an excellent choice. Why do you think Ring DNA chose him? Because Andy was already an influencer on his own, but here comes Ring DNA. And then they put this thing together, which kind of goes to what you're talking about here about influencers. What, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, so I've not spoke to Andy since this, uh, but it was uh, pitched as an acquisition of the podcast. Now, Andy works there as well, so it's clearly an acquisition of Andy, right? right? Uh, but I, right. I don't know the ins and outs of it, just, just to be clear. Sure. Um, it's a smart move. <laughs> All brands I, should be grabbing really hold of these individuals. Because especially if you look at, again, I don't know the ins and outs of the deal. I don't know if there's a, hopefully Andy got a bit massive payout on the back of it um, or, or you know, great salary with the job, whatever. I, I don't know the ins and outs. But they are buying a, a podcast, which is, and I've been on there as well, the, and Andy's been on, on the sales podcast a bunch of times, that has, I think it's say seven, 800 downloads. That is a real valuable chunk of content that if, Again, Andy's valuable being within the organization. But if nothing else, that is, if it's, say, seven, 800 episodes, it's probably five, 600 hours worth of video interviews, each of which just transcribed is, you know, seven, 8,000 words. So that adds up very quickly when you put it onto your blog from the search engine optimization standpoint. And, and I don't want to lose people down the marketing conversation here when we obviously we want to talk about sales. But then you can repurpose all that content. It creates a lot of smaller clips. You can repurpose it. And this is what some of the videos that we're doing next year. And it'll come from some of this This Week in Sales content as well. Of It'll be me and some of the team here reflecting on some of the conversations that have already happened and adding more context to them. Because obviously a, a conversation is free flowing. And so there might be things that get missed that could be added on after the, after the point. They've basically bought unlimited content for the next 10 years, as long as the conversations remain uh, relevant. So it's a, it's a crazy smart move. And B2B brands, they're doing it right now. As I said, brands have taught, I, I've had to sign NDAs about things. And Victor, I'll tell you off, off there about uh, different things that have gone on in, in the past few years. But brands have tried to buy what we're doing. And it's always been better. I was going to ask you that, by the way. I'll, sure. By the way, I, I, I got to ask this just because the audience okay. is thinking it. I'm thinking it. My my. My Christmas turtle, you can't see the, the stuffed animal, but that's he's thinking it also, is that will you have how many podcasts thus far on the Sales Med podcast? How many podcasts do you have? Uh, so so oh. right now, three or four. I, I, when this comes out, who knows? Because there's a, a couple of collaborations coming. No, no. I mean, how many podcasts have you uh, oh, published, published already? Podcasts. I think we're on like 700. Yeah. 700. And then you got, I don't know how many videos. You got a lot of videos on YouTube. So sure. you got a lot of content. You know, I'm just going to give you a thousand assets right now. Sure. Let's just call it a thousand assets, podcasts and videos. So, Will, would Will self out for the right price, team with a good company? By sell out, I mean team up with a great company mm -hmm. if the right price was put in front of him. Yeah, that's been the goal. So I've been very open and honest about this. That's been the goal from the very beginning. The to get, We're not quite at that point, though. When you look at um, – it's very difficult to – it's very difficult to put a price on an organization like what we built and you know, what you're building yourself, Victor, in that if you look at revenue and you do a multiple of revenue, well, that's a nice amount and it's it's probably, it's enough to get my, my attention, right? And that's how a lot of technology companies and small businesses are sold, a multiple of revenue, three to six times of revenue. And that's enough that maybe I'm not going to retire for the rest of my life, but it, it retires me for the next 20 years while I find out the next thing that I want to that I want to do, right? But when you look at then influence in the marketplace, and it's not it's not necessarily me. I don't think my ego isn't, I'm this hero in the space and people listen to me. I don't mean it from that perspective, but I mean it from the the almost like the tentacles of salesman.org, all the different podcasts, the content, just the sheer amount of stuff we've published over the years, being on so many different websites and all that kind of stuff. That then becomes very difficult to value as a brand wanting to make an acquisition. So 
we've had two serious conversations now. I get, I'll tell you off there, but um, I've had signed NDAs with both of them and they wouldn't be impressed if I started talking about them. And but both occasions it was, hey, plod along for another three or four years and let's continue the conversation then. And then at a certain point, it'll be a no-brainer for you to sell and you know we want everything that you're, you're doing regardless. So does that answer your question? Hopefully, I'm, I'm not, trying not to be too question. cryptic. I'm I, trying to be open about no, it. No, no, no. I, I, I think you're a great influencer in, in the sales arena. So I think it would be wise for a company to come aggressively after you. That's what I think. Good. That's I, my I man appreciate will. that. I, I Just don't forget cons- the small people. When you when you graduate, <laughs> don't forget the small people, okay? Like us, like peons down here. So, all right, let's 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 keep going. Well, let's keep going. People are going to get bored with this topic. Hey, guess what? Gong dot. By the way, did you want to add anything else to this uh the influencer conversation. I, I, th- I think we've done it there. I think we've. There's a few more points. You'll find that in the article uh, that's linked to in the show notes of this episode. Okay, the Gong.io releases. I just thought this was a, a, a just a. It's Gong. Gong just does something. You're like, what are you doing now? Like Gong.io. What are you doing now? Releases an SKO. That's the thing they caught. I go, what's an SKO? And it stands for Sales Kickoff Checklist for 2021. Well, they, well it's for 2020, but it's for 2021 going forward. It says, if you want to kick off a meeting, and they, I actually downloaded this thing, and it really is like a roadmap for a kickoff. It, it goes through the, I just gave you like, what I'm going to read out is like maybe 2% of what they actually had in. I was blown away. And so I got the link right there for you. Uh, on delivering, one of the sections was on delivering valuable content, celebrate the past year, make the big reveals, disclose new targets, provide access to executives, maybe have them on the call. Encourage interactive learning, gamify the fun during your sales kickoff meeting, and nail the closing. In other words, what's your call to action for your team going forward? And that was their simple checklist under delivering valuable content. But Gong Dot, they actually took the time to really like put together a real nice document for how you should put together a kickoff meeting. And I was kind of blown away by that. So I want to know, because clearly virtual kickoff meetings are the the mainstream right now. That's how everyone's having to do things with social distancing and, and lockdowns and all that kind of thing. Is this data driven, Victor? Has this come from someone presenting on stage, even via Gong, and then looking at how people are engaging with that uh, stage performance? Because if not, then that should that should be a, a platform uh, somewhere else for because everyone's doing remote and virtual events right now. It'd be great to be able to even do eye tracking or something like that to see whether someone's actually paying attention to what's going on on the stage at a potential kickoff. Or are these things that Gong assume that make a good sales kickoff, but there's no data behind them? The latter. They assume they'll make it good and there's no data behind it. It's just a nice... Look, they just, for for a moment in time, Gong became an event planner. <laughs> That's the thing. So to the CEO, Amit Bendoff, nice job on the event planning. So <laughs> he's going to hear this and go, really? But anyway, I just thought it was, it's, it's a fun item to mention. I just thought it was interesting. I yeah. just thought it was interesting. And, and for anyone who wants to see it, we'll link it in the show notes as well. And tell us about Gartner, Victor. Gartner surveys finds 90% of HR leaders will allow employees. This falls under the culture section here at the This Week in Sales. By the way, don't forget to go to thisweekinsales.com. If you have any feedback, press releases, things you want us to know, questions you have, maybe want to question Will's English, all that stuff can be included in the contact form to send us something and some feedback. Anyway, Gardner finds that 90% of HR leaders will allow employees to work remotely even after the COVID-19 vaccine is available. Nearly two-thirds of HR leaders surveyed said they will continue all safety measures, obviously. Uh, the survey of 130 leaders on December 9th revealed that 90% of respondents plan to allow employees to work remotely at least part-time. And that's not really shocking, is it? The, but as you move further down, it says 65% of respondents reported that their organization will continue to offer flex time. But also, look at the last bullet point. Uh, 109 of those HR leaders who responded to Gartner's survey predict that about 50% of the workforce will want to return to the workplace at least part-time once the vaccine is widely available. I thought that was interesting, right? So they're pretty optimistic about people wanting to go back to the workplace. What are your thoughts on that? I think people will say things until the reality of being able to go back to a workforce uh, workplace exists. So I would I would take all of that with a pinch of salt because if you've been working in your pajamas for the past six months, 
nobody's com- or the year at this point, right? And, and no one's complained. And perhaps you are, as we covered last week, you are slightly less efficient, but still efficient from that environment. And maybe it's a better working environment. It's better for your mental health. You feel less burnt out. You're not having to travel. As soon as, because don't forget everyone's working from home. A lot of people work from home. So I know in the UK, the roads are less manic than what they usually are. And I hate driving. I've done it in medical device sales. I've done enough driving on busy roads. I'm done with that. It will never happen again. So I get to the office at 7 a.m. every morning rather than coming at 8 or 9 just to avoid the traffic. So I think once the offices start opening, once the, the vaccines are rolling out uh, with rapid pace now and you know, where we're lucky enough to be able to have them in the US, UK, Europe, uh, Russia, elsewhere. Uh, so you know, we should be grateful for that. But once people start going back to the office, once you start going, oh, bloody hell, hey, Barry, he's a pain in the ass. He won't leave me alone. And you you reminisce on all these times of working from home and the traffic gets worse and worse and it takes you an hour and a half to get into the office every day. And that's time you just don't have to spend with your family, your kids, your dog, whatever it is. I feel like a lot of these numbers don't mean anything until cause it's been a year. We forget. Humans forget after one sleep, never mind after 365 of them. I think a lot of these numbers are massively unreliable until it happens mm. and we can actually we can see what uh, we can see what actually happens in the real world yeah i don't know what to make of those numbers because i i'm like people really want to get back to work that whole thing about 50 percent of people really want to get back to work at least part time going i i've not met a person that says can't wait to go back <laughs> into the office again but you know what i mean i just i mean i get it but anyway hey i'm going to jump to the last part here because there's a new book release called game of sales Sounds dramatic, doesn't it? Lessons learned working at Adobe, Amazon, Google, and IBM. So it's a new book uh, just released. Game of Sales is the candid conversation you always wanted to have. I, by the way, I love these descriptions when they <laughs> write these, right? It's a game. It's the conversation you've always wanted to have with the top enterprise salesperson. David Perry. Big shout out, David Perry. Holds nothing back. He takes you behind the scenes of what he learned working for the top companies like Adobe, Amazon, Google, and IBM. He's going to share some tools, strategies, techniques to help you beat, you get the idea, your number, and create mega deals. I, what I like about this, I haven't read the book yet. Again, I just wanted to highlight some new releases, maybe get people some content. The foreword was written by Mark, do you say Roberge? I think it's Roberge, Roberge, who wrote the sales acceleration formula. And if Mark endorsed it with a foreword, I think this book is going to be worth reading. So anyway, just want to give some people some tools and something to read on the weekend, Well. I want to address this, and it's in the doc. Victor, how many books do you read a week or a month? And what percentage of them are sales-specific books? So I read about uh, a book a week easy. That's about that's about right. I just finished reading uh, They Ask, You Answer by yeah. Marcus, Marcus Sheridan. Yeah. Have you read that book? It's a great book. A lot of our content is based on the principles of that book. In that, in that book, I finally got around to reading it. I spoke on the same stage with Marcus about two years ago, met him, nice guy, super dude. Uh, so yeah, it's a great book, by the way. It's a great read. It's an easy read. It is a philosophy changer when it comes to sharing content and be very transparent. So I read about one book. What was the second part of that question? It's about uh, one book a week. What percentage of those books are, uh, excuse me, traditional sales books? 90% easy, 95%. Really? Yeah. And by the way, I mean, they're starting to lean more into the marketing space a little bit more. Like if you really think about uh, Marcus Sheridan's book, that's really more of a marketing book, content marketing uh, book. And so the thing is, there's always something in the sales book. It's like going through a ra- down a rabbit hole and you're like, I didn't realize that. And there's some nuances. And so, yeah, I'm going to add it. How many books do you read? So I used to read, I used to be an absolute savage. I, so i uh, give it more context. Until I was about 23, it was just when I was starting to leave uh, or plan to leave and start the business uh, and leave my last medical device sales job. I basically hadn't read anything. So then I started reading self-help. Then I read uh, Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within, and it took me probably six months to read it. It's a beast of a... I've got a, big, I've got a box of them there. I send them to people all the time because it, it sounds cheesy, especially with being Mr. Robbins, but he definitely changed my life. And I went through every exercise in it, and I've never done anything like that before. So it really had an impact and it made me change my priorities and, and explain to me how I, uh, what motivated me and all that side of things. From that point on, I would easily read a book a week, if not more. But recently, I've, I've been on a bit of a, cause this is why I asked the question, I've been on, uh, I've just not managed to be interested in them. I've not picked up anything uh, at all for the past 
three, four months that's held my attention more than you know, a chapter or two. And I'm, I'm still going and, and looking at reviews on things. I'm not just reading anything that just comes out any, any old trash. But I'm really struggling with my reading at the moment, Victor. And the reason I asked you your question was, should salespeople read sales books or should they read a broad range? And for someone who doesn't read sales books, who's listening right now, myself, how can we motivate ourselves to read more? Because clearly, people who are successful in life read. There's a massive correlation. Yeah. Co- 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 correlation. Correlation there. Correlation. So the I, I have a rule. It's called the 100-page rule. Can I tell you about my 100-page rule? Which is pretty obvious, right? If it doesn't hold my attention by page 100, I donate it to Goodwill. Like literally, it does not stay. Uh, twice a year, I purge my bookshelf. I'm not that guy that has this massive bookshelf just to impress you. Look how big my bookshelf <laughs> is. I'm not into that. And so I have something called the golden shelf that I joke about. And the golden shelf is only the best of the best books stay on my shelf. And so there's times where I can't read something well. So I've gone through my, my, my reading winters where I'm just like not feeling reading anything. Uh, I would subscribe. I would, uh, I, I guess, uh, suggest to people Read the books that you need for the moment you're in and what you're looking for. I mean, that's really the best way of doing it. Sure. I think if you, you say, I'm in need of this, I need to know about this, then I'm reading that. Uh, when I pick up a sales book, it's not just any sales book. I'm trying to figure out how do I do that? That's like right now, I just bought a book. I don't know the author's name, but I just downloaded it on Kindle. And it's about it's about buyer engagement. Now I'm looking at it from the buyer side, which is more of a marketing side. And so that because that's what I'm interested in right now. But don't feel bad, Will. You'll come out of your funk, man. I, I've done that. I've gone like two, three, four, five months without reading something. And I think your brain just needs to absorb other things around you. And until something comes from you that you need something, I'm not trying to motivate you, but I just said, let it flow, man. If, if it's now, it's not the not right time to read. It's not the right time to read. I appreciate that. Because sometimes you can yeah. put pressure on yourself, right, to do something, which then blocks you from doing it. And a lot of it as well is I could just be more disciplined and just sit down and read. I'm choosing not to for whatever reason. So it's you know, I'm not on about it. what I'm doing is not rocket yeah. science, is it? No. No, I wanted to suggest let me see if I could find it. There's something called the productivity summary. Have you seen this? Uh if you go to uh, okay, it's a productivity summary and the guy does a one page summary, puts a video online all the time of a book. And what I like about his summary, yeah, if you go to the website, it's called productivitygame.com, productivitygame.com. And he always does a book summary with the video and then lets you download a one-page PDF of the book. Now, if you subscribe to his uh, program, he really gives you more information. But if you just want a quick flavor of something before you buy it, this is a great website. And his videos are like seven, eight minutes, and it'll let you know whether you want it or not. So check out productivitygame.com. Perfect. Well, and Victor, his name is something. His name is he is a student, to find it, I can. engineer, project manager, entrepreneur, and storyteller. And then it doesn't say his name afterwards. So with that yeah, branding, and <laughs> you, can, you can you can you can have the plug of the website. We're not giving you your name if you're not going to list it yourself. With that, Victor, I'm conscious yeah. of time, mate. So wrap us up with what did you call it? You call it a Greek story earlier on. A Greek tragedy. Greek, Greek tragedy. tragedy. You know, at the end, there's never there's never a happy ending, right? Sure. Greek stories. It's like somebody dies. It's never like. I feel like I've, the issue has been resolved at the end. So I have to tell you the story. This this just happened Thursday. It was right after we filmed our, uh, was it Thursday? No, we filmed on Wednesday, the last week, right? And so I, I'm doing this presentation for a big company, huge, massive presentation, right? I'm charging $5,000 for this keynote, right? So I'm online just like this, got everything going, everything in my studio is running well, everything's good. I'm on for two hours watching everybody else. Got a little chair over here where I just kind of sit back and watch. And then I'm just kind of warming up, rubbing my hands like, ah, I'm going to kill this one. Got my smart board, the whole thing. I'm, I'm just lit up, ready to go, right? And so, man, I get into this presentation. I'm drilling this presentation. I am driving this presentation. Do you understand me, Will? I am driving this presentation. <laughs> I can and only imagine. Then the 15-minute mark, uh, somebody interrupts me. Uh, Victor, uh, something's wrong with your connection. Your voice sounds funny, like a robot. And then all of a sudden, everything starts wigging out. Like everything starts freezing. And if you've been on a Zoom call, you know what I'm talking about. It starts freezing. We're using WebEx, by the way. That's the irony of this. WebEx was, the, remember, the, the, the CEO of Zoom, Eric Yuan, left WebEx because he's fought, he found a lot of problems with their platform. Yeah, it came back to haunt me. So I'm doing this. Bottom line is, we had it. We had to cancel the the keynote because then I couldn't log back into WebEx. 
tank, 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 and then we canceled, and I lost $5,000 because of bad Wi-Fi connection. So let me tell you what I did, Will, because there's two ways of looking at this. <laughs> One is like, you know, you could just rant to the heavens and shake your fist, or you can do what I did. We just call Comcast and say, I want you to pipe a one gig Ethernet connection straight into my computer, which is what I have now. So I call this the $5,000 Ethernet connection now. I am piped in. So that's what happened. So this falls under Wi-Fi sucks, life sucks, but you don't have to suck. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I love it. I, I, I'll give you... So this has been the last place... Um, if people have consumed the content in the past, when the TV was to the side of me and there was the fake brick wall, it was literally, <laughs> some people don't realize this, it was just a, a laminated fake brick that I just stuck on the wall behind me. They weren't real fake bricks. In that place, I had terrible internet. And so I did loads of research and there was nothing we could do at that moment in time. Here we've got great internet. Literally the box, the exchange is right at the bottom of the building. So it's the cables, maybe like 40 foot. But Victor, this may be useful for you. And the reason I bring it up is it might be useful for anyone else who's working from home. So I wouldn't buy it yourself if you're in sales, but your team might, uh, your boss might buy it. There is a device. It is quite expensive and it costs about a grand a year uh, to use it. But it, uh, you basically plug your Ethernet into it and it's got two 5G SIM cards in it. And if your internet drops, it will seamlessly... Um, it's, it's called to bond the network connection together. And so it'll drop onto the two 5G network uh, connection cards and will give you seamless wireless internet, even if there's, you know, someone comes along and, and un unplugs your cable from the outside of your house or whatever it is. Again, it's I think it's about a grand a, a year to subscribe to the service. I think the hardware might come for free if you pay that subscription, but that might be something considering. And if I didn't have such good internet here, that would be something I'd consider as well. In fact, I've said all this. Oh, my router, it's a Synology router. You can plug a 4G um, SIM card into that to do a similar thing as well. Um, so just by, by the way, just out of curiosity, on. what did you just call that? A router? Yes, yeah, so you call it a router, right? Right. Okay. So that's the difference again. So, I had to highlight one word today. So it's, is it router or is it router? So it's a router. Now, a router is a tool that bevels the edge of a, a piece of wood to shape a piece right. of wood if you've got a skirting board or something like that. I assume it's still That's called a router, a router yep. in the US. Right. So I feel like it's not a reasonable thing to say that I'm correct here in that what you're saying, if you're saying that they're both the same thing, clearly they're different devices. And so calling one a router and one a router is the only logical, sensible, and correct way to go about this. Is that fair? I think it is. I think you would win the argument though, because if you go on that route, take that route, which is take that direction sure. and a router is used to bevel the edge. So yeah. I think I'm going to give you that one. But by the way, I think this box, it literally is, there you go. I think this box, this box is about literally like 10 feet from my, my computer now. And you've turned me on to something. And maybe those uh, folks who are listening might find this interesting is that it comes with a Wi-Fi backup inside the router. Perfect. It comes with a Wi-Fi backup, but that's interesting to know. Yep. Good tip there of the week. Because uh, clearly everyone's having these same problems, right? You only need some idiot down the street to to pull on something or to complain and, and beat. I, 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 you have Comcast and I don't know who else you have in the US, but in the UK, there's far more, uh, it's not as monopolistic. There's far more smaller, bigger companies who do this, but they all go through the same, same exchange boxes. You only need some numbnuts to come and unplug something. And you've got no internet for a week. <laughs> so having an alternative when we're all working from home, might be the smart decision. Is that it, Victor? Are we wrapping up with that, mate? I think we should wrap up on a positive note. Get your connection right. That'll get your sales right. That'll get everything right. How's that? I don't know. It's <laughs> all you will. <laughs> well, with that, that is Victor Antonio, complete legend in the world of sales. My name is Will Barron, and you've just been tuning into This Week in Sales. You can go to thisweekinsales.com if you want to give us a press release of any product or feature that you'd like us to talk about on the show. If you've got any feedback, drop it in there, and we'll see you this time next week.